Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Shauna Gordon McKeon. Uh, I am a Python programmer. I've got a background in a bunch of different things, including social psychology, community building, and governance. Uh, and I have to start this off by saying that I was not at all a part of Python's recent governance changes, uh, nor do I have any experience in the governance of Python itself. But I'm really interested in the topic of governance in general. And I asked around to see if anyone was going to be presenting on this at PyCon, and the answer was no. And I was like, well, someone should present on this at PyCon. And here I am. <laughs> uh, so why do I think this is such an important topic? Well, I saw this tweet recently, uh, and I really love it. Uh, because I have spent many years as part of this Python community without really thinking about how things run. And I was just like, oh, Git is the BDFL. The PSF exists. Things seem to be going fine. And sometimes it takes a kid's relentless curiosity to go ahead and actually ask, wait, what is a BDFL? What does it mean? How does the PSF run? What other roles even exist? And how do people get into those roles? Uh, another thing that can get us asking questions like that is a big conflict or shakeup. And I think that's what happened to a lot of folks last year when Guido announced that he was going to be stepping down as the BDFL. So this talk is meant to try and answer some of these questions, and it's going to be roughly chronological. I'm going to start by talking about how Python used to run, then we'll go into what changed, and then finally we'll talk a little bit about how things work now. So let's get to it. So I made this chart. I am not a professional chart designer, so my apologies. But I made this chart to help myself understand all of the different elements of the Python community holistically. Uh, so this represents how things used to be about a year ago. So one of the first things that may leap out to you is that the Python Software Foundation and the Python language are two distinct groups with two distinct governance processes. And this is something I did not understand myself, despite having been involved in Python and coming to PyCon for close to a decade. I think part of why this has been a little confusing for people is that historically, Guido has been the leader of both groups. So even though they're technically separate, they're sort of like united in their leadership. Um, so people assume that they're more legally entangled than they are. Um, so which group does what? Well, the PSF manages the intellectual property of Python. And they're also responsible for a lot of community building and community management. For instance, they run PyCon, and they do a great job with it. Uh, they also sponsor other conferences and meetups, run diversity initiatives, and more. Whereas the Python language is focused on developing CPython. So I'm going to focus mostly on the Python language, but I did want to take a moment to talk about how the PSF runs, because after all, it's an important part of our community, too. So the PSF is a 501c3 nonprofit, and all nonprofits have a board of directors who govern the project. Now, most nonprofits have what's called self-perpetuating boards of directors, which means the boards appoint new directors themselves. They do have a legal responsibility as a nonprofit, but to be frank, a lot of boards decline into irrelevance and mismanagement because there's not a ton of accountability because they're self-perpetuating. And I could, I, could, I could do a whole talk on some of the problems with self-perpetuating boards, but I won't because I am pleased to say that the PSF is a member-elected board which means that PSF members elect their own leadership. Uh, and so because the PSF is member elected, let's take a second to talk about how that membership works. So there's five kinds of members. There's basic members, and anyone who wants to can become a basic member. All you have to do is agree to follow the code of conduct. However, basic members are the only kind of PSF members who can't vote. There are four kinds of voting members contributing, wait, contributing, supporting, managing, and there's also something, something called a Python fellow. And so you can become this kind of member through donating, through uh, contributing in a variety of different ways, or being uh, selected or nominated and then elected by existing fellow uh, members to be a PSF fellow. Um, and so those latter four kinds of members are voting members. And I think limiting voting to people who have contributed to the community in some concrete way is a useful way to make sure that the people who are voting on leadership have a real stake in the community. And the PSF actually does some other interesting things regarding voting, uh, like they require people to declare their intention to vote at the beginning of the year. And in order to keep your voting eligibility for the length of the year, you can't miss, I think, more than four votes in a row. 
And again, this rewards participation and encourages sustained engagement so that the people who are making decisions at any given time are the ones who have been engaged with the community in a sustained way, which I think is really great and interesting. But enough about the PSF, let's go back to Python the language. So it's with uh, the Python language team that we get the idea of Guido as a benevolent dictator for life. Because as I just stressed, there is never a way in which he was a dictator of the PSF because member elected nonprofits simply can't have dictators benevolent or otherwise. So instead, he was the BDFL of the language side of things. So what does it mean to be the BDFL? Uh, in theory, it means that you're in charge of everything. But Python's a big, big project with a lot going on. And so really, there's a whole group of people who are involved in the day-to-day -day work of the project. And that is the Python core team. Uh, and the sort of Python contributors who are a wider group of people of whom the core team is a subset. Um, and so these are the people who are doing the work of uh, creating Python, making decisions, and it's when there's a conflict or a high-level design decision that Guido would step in and have the sort of ultimate say. Uh, and uh, practically speaking, a lot of how this authority got exercised is through uh, deciding which PEPs got accepted or rejected. So sidebar, what's a PEP? So PEP stands for Python Enhancement Proposal, and it's how the community makes decisions about lander design, language, designs, standards, and processes. The most well-known of these is probably PEP8. Who here has heard of PEP8? Yeah, almost everyone. Uh, so that's the one that uh, lays out the style guide for Python, but there's actually several hundred PEPs out there. PEP1 goes into great detail about uh, what PEPs are and how they're decided on, but I'll give you the TLDR here. So first off, someone authors a PEP. If that person who's authoring the PEP is on the core team, they can just directly submit the PEP. Uh, if you are not on the core team, you have to get a core team member to sponsor your PEP. Then there's a period of debate uh, where people talk about it, discuss it, give feedback, and there's a specific person who uh, is given sort of a managership of that PEP who can kind of say, OK, I think we're ready to vote on it, or you know, I think it needs more work. Uh, and sometimes, historically, this was Guido. Uh, sometimes it was the BDFL delegate. So the idea being that Guido was delegating his authority as the decision maker to someone who uh, is better, more experienced in that area, can make a better decision. Uh, sometimes Guido asked them to take the role, sometimes they self-nominated, but it's my understanding that there was little to no conflict ever around who took that BDFL delegate role. Um, so uh, in the end, uh, Guido or the BDFL delegate would rule that the PEP was accepted or rejected, or one of a couple of other uh, less common end states that a PEP could end in. So to come back to our chart of how things used to be, you can see that we've got this group of contributors, the group of core developers who sort of manage the contribution process, and then uh, the BDFL who can sort of step in when there's conflict and say, this is how we're doing things. So it's a system that worked for us for many years, uh, but it's not our system anymore. So what happened? So there was a PEP, 572, uh, there's a talk on that PEP that happened the other day by Dustin Ingram, if you're interested in learning more about it. For our purposes, it really doesn't matter what the content of the PEF was. What matters is that it was a heated discussion, highly controversial, very stressful for the people involved. And at the end of it, as you heard Guido say this morning, if you went to the uh, Steering Council keynote, uh, it left him with a feeling that he just didn't want to be BDFL anymore. So he sent out an email saying, essentially, I resign. You figure out what you want to do next. Uh, so Python was faced with this question, who's in charge now? So they could have just selected another BDFL, but there's no one obvious person with the sort of trust or legitimacy or history to just step into that role. So really, before they could tackle the who's in charge question, they were faced with the question, well, what is our governance model even going to be? But they didn't really have any way to decide that either, because Guido had always just been the BDFL, and he didn't want to like, unilaterally pick the new governance method. He wanted uh, the community to make a decision. So really, before they could tackle what our governance model is going to be, they were faced with the question, how do we decide what our governance model is going to be? Uh, so three distinct layers of decision making happening here. Uh, and it's important for all communities that are making these kinds of governance decisions to recognize that there are multiple levels which have to be tackled 
separately. So I like to use the United States as an example because I am from the United States and therefore I'm intimately familiar with it. So how did the United States government or the community of people who became the United States answer these questions? Well, they started off with the question, how do we decide what our governance model is going to be? And they decided they were going to have a constitutional convention in Philadelphia and they were going to come up with a model that was going to be ratified by the states. Actually, that's a little bit of a lie. A lot of people came to that convention thinking they were going to be fixing the Articles of Confederation, and when they got there, it was like, surprise, we want to do a whole new constitution. Uh, but that's the sort of venue in which they made that decision. Uh, what is our governance model going to be? That was the actual US Constitution. And then the question of who's going to be in charge is the first president, the first Congress, the first judiciary system. And as you can see, these needed to happen in a specific order in time. You can't get the George Washington as the president before you have a president, and you can't know that you're going to have a president until you decide how you're going to decide whether or not you want a president. So, so back, to, back to Python. So let's start with that first fundamental question, how do we decide what our governance model is going to be? So there were several months of intense online and in-person conversations about this. Uh, in September of 2018, there was an in-person meeting of the core team in Redmond, and those who couldn't make it in person joined remotely. There was a lot of discussion of, on the threads in uh, discuss.python.org. But eventually, they consensed around an answer, which was laid out in PEP 8001. And the short version is uh, that people could submit proposals for new governance models in the form of PEPs, and that after a period in time, the community was going to vote on which one to choose. Uh, so who got to propose? Well, it was through submitting a PEP, so the answer is core developers or someone who could get a core developer sponsor, but practically it was just core developers who submitted proposals. Who got to vote? So the PEP says uh, active core developers could vote, and it was a bit of an honor system there. The PEP says we are asking core developers to self-select based on whether the governance situation will affect them directly. And I think this is really good idea. There's a lot of research that says that communities function best when the people most impacted by a decision have the primary say in making that decision. And if you want to learn more about that sort of research background, I gave a uh, talk at LibrePlanet back in March, uh, which I've got a link to at the end of my slides, which goes into some of the research that uh, leads us to believe that statements like the one I just baldly made uh, are true. Uh, so the final thing that PEP 8001 lays out is how the vote works. Uh, and there was a whole discussion thread before this about what voting method would be best. I won't go into it here, but there's a long thread about it on discuss.python.org if you're a voting methods nerd. Uh, the end result was they chose a Condorcet method of voting, which is a form of ranked voting, which is uh, believed to be a better way of getting consensus than the sort of majority first-past-the-post system that we're used to. Uh, that I am used to in the US. Um, and it was administered by the PSF uh, in the person of Ernest W. Uh, Durbin III, also our PyCon chair, uh, who is the PSF's director of infrastructure. And again, I think this was a great idea, a good way to take advantage of the, P the fact that the PSF exists as a relatively neutral third party. So we've got PEP 8001 is the equivalent of the Constitutional Convention and Ratification of the States. So let's move on to what the actual governance model is. Uh, so they started out this discussion by uh, doing a survey, uh, which is in PEP 8002, the Open Source Governance Survey. Uh, they researched the governance of Rust, OpenStack, Jupyter, Django, TypeScript, AstroPy, and Microsoft. And this document is a great resource far beyond the Python community itself because it gives a series of case studies about how other projects have made these kinds of decisions. So I wanted to give a shout out to the five authors of this PEP, uh, Barry Warsaw, Lucas Langa, Antoine Petru, Doug Hellman, and Carol Willing. Thank you for doing this work, which I think will benefit all of us. Uh, and I actually am using this uh, to start off a new project, hopefully it will remain a minor project, uh, which is just, a, I'm just collecting case studies of governance in uh, open communities. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I will be linking to that at the end of the talk as well. Uh, so here are, the, here are some of the specific models that ended up getting uh, uh, introduced. I will go through this pretty quickly, because uh, after all, we only ended up using one of them. Uh, but there's some, there's some interesting options in here. So there's the technical leader model, 
which is uh, uh, an elected BDFL, so really a, a BDF, BDFN, Benevolent Dictator for Now, or a, it was meant to be for every three releases, so BDF3R? I don't know, I don't know. It, it loses a little bit of its punch. Uh, and they'd be helped by a council of people who would all be core devs. There's the trio of Pythonistas model, uh, and what I thought was interesting about this one is that uh, everyone had to run as slates, which would ensure, hopefully ensure, that the people who were elected worked well together because they were running together. Yeah. Uh, the community governance model, which is one of my favorites, uh, expands on the idea of the experts index. So for those of you who don't know, there's an existing thing called the experts index, which is a way to keep track of which members of the contributor community have expertise in given areas of Python, and you can use that to get feedback on potential PEPs that impact those areas. So the community governance model would have taken that and said the uh, people who are listed as experts are the ones who decide on the PEPs in those areas with the ability of the core devs to get together and overrule a specific decision if they were like, no, that expert made a bad decision. Uh, there is the external council governance model, uh, the most interesting thing about this one is that uh, people could not be core devs. Uh, so the goal, of, the goal here is to put power in the hands of a neutral third party, which is an interesting goal. Uh, it's definitely the only uh, one of these proposals that really is trying to take power away from the core devs. So interesting. Uh, there is the commons slash anarchist governance model. So the title of this proposal is the commons governance model, but the author says that they used commons uh, instead of anarchist as a phrase because anarchist has negative uh, connotations, but the pedantic person in me who studies commons governance is like, no, commons governance and anarchist governance are separate things. Uh, so I just you know, did a little bit of editorializing and crossed out the <laughs> commons and put the anarchist back. Uh, and my understanding of this proposal is it has a sort of council of elders who make a lot of context-based decisions about whether a PEP should be voted on or whether there's already consensus. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't really fully understand this one. Uh, there's the steering committee model, which has a three-member committee who make high-level design decisions but do not decide on PEPs. They're not allowed to decide on PEPs. Instead, they can either select a PEP delegate or hold a vote of all of the core team. And finally, there's the steering council model, which is a five-member committee elected for the length of a release. They can make decisions about PEPs, but the proposal, the language they use says, please don't try to delegate responsibility as much as possible. Only step in when you really have to and try instead to make decisions uh, that will enable other people to do it instead of making one-off decisions yourself. Uh, so these were all discussed online before the vote happened, and you can see the debate there. It's really interesting. Um, uh, Victor Stinner, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, did a nice comparison of the proposals. I've got it linked at the end of my slides, uh, and talked about some of the different ways in which these proposals differ. So some of them distributed versus centralized power, the number of people in leadership roles, the importance of being a core dev. One of the proposals was like, no, you can't be a core dev. Other proposals were like, you have to be a core dev. Uh, how, how PEPs are handled how leadership that people don't have confidence in any longer is handled. Uh, other things that people considered were how much burden was a particular process going to put on the core devs, many of whom are unpaid volunteers. Uh, and another interesting thing was some people were arguing that formally implicit processes should be made explicit, while other people were saying, no, let's leave things informal uh, and only make them explicit once we have to. So. Finally, they held the actual vote. You can see it yourself at the Civis website. Again, linked at the end of my talk. Uh, the winner was PEP 8016, aka the Steering Council model. And we'll go into that in just a minute. But first, I want to update my little chart here. So the Steering Council model is our sort of constitutional equivalent to the US Constitution, which leaves us with the final question of who is in charge now. So uh, the PEP proposal specifies how people become part of the steering council, which is through elections. Uh, so this January, elections were held again in the PSF, again uh, administered by Ernest W. Durbin III, and the first steering council was elected. Uh, Barry Warsaw, Brett Cannon, Carol Wooling, Guido Van Rossum, and Nick Coughlin, uh, and many of you probably saw them today earlier at the uh, keynote. Uh, and this election is documented in PEP 8100 because everything's a PEP. All right, so we've got our people down here, the equivalent of George Washington, and, and the all-important judicial and legislative branches as well. Can't forget them. Balances of power. 
theoretical balances of power. <laughs> uh, so this is how we got where we are, but okay, where are we now? So you can see on this chart, we've replaced our BDFL with a steering council, but it's not quite as simple as a one-for-one -one replacement because where Guido was in a very clear, fairly clear position of authority over the core team, the steering council is in a more equal role. So let's get into a little bit of detail about how actually the core team and the steering council relate to each other. And these are all taken from PEP 13, which is the PEP that describes the current constitution slash governance. So the core team is very similar to the existing core team previously. Membership is granted by receiving a two-thirds positive vote from the existing core team and no veto by the steering council. So the steering council now has a veto over membership. There's no time limit on being a core team member. Once you join, you can stay. But uh, people who haven't made contributions in a while can be made inactive and temporarily lose their privilege at voting privileges until they become active again. Uh, the steering council is five people. They uh, make decisions via a majority vote of non-abstaining members. They're nominated by the core team and they're elected by the core team. And no more than two people who are employed by the same company can serve on the council at the same time, just to avoid uh, the sense that the, uh, that the steering council is biased towards any one particular company or employer. The core team has authority over the Python project infrastructure. Hold on a second. They have uh, authority over the Python project infrastructure, like the project website, the GitHub repositories, bug tracker, mailing lists, IRC, et cetera. Uh, and they have the responsibility of electing the steering council. The steering council has the mandate of assuring the reliability and stability of the Python language, making contributing accessible and sustainable and diverse. They help liaise with the PSF. And they're tasked, especially now at this beginning part, with the decision, establishing decision-making processes and resolving uh, controversial decisions. The steering council is explicitly given the right to accept or reject PEPs and enforce the code of conduct. But as I said before, the proposal specifically stresses that they should try to do as little of that as possible. Uh, so the proposal says, instead of voting, it's better to seek consensus. Instead of ruling on individual PEPs, it's better to define a standard process for PEP decision-making. It's better to establish a code of conduct committee than to rule on individual cases and so on. So both the core team and the steering council have recourse if members of the other group are causing problems. The core team can vote of, have a vote of no confidence in individual steering council members or in the council as a whole. Uh, that has to happen via a two-thirds majority. If the council as a whole is removed, uh, there's an immediate election to create a new council. And similarly, the steering council can vote to eject members of the core team, again requiring a two-thirds majority, but obviously the hope is that none of this will be necessary. So as you can see, there's a sort of balance of, pow balance of power between these two groups. That said, PEP 13 outlines how PEP 13 itself can be changed, which is by a two-thirds vote of the core team. So the fundamental authority here is still with the core team, because if enough of them believe that the governance process needs to be offered, uh, altered, then they're the ones who can do it. And if the steering council wants to alter things, they have to convince the core team to do it. So that is our current governance system. So going forward, going forward, uh, what's going to change? Well, unless you're already a Python contributor or a member of the core team, probably not that much is going to change from your perspective. But that being said, the governance transition is still happening. The steering council has been tasked with, uh, hold on again, The steering council has been tasked with figuring out the details of the transition, figuring out which of the previous prof, uh, processes that worked with the BDFL uh, may no longer work and may need to be changed. So there may be some more visible changes coming on down the line. <coughs> and if you're interested in the work that the steering council is doing, uh, you can take a look at the keynote from this morning uh, and also engage with them in various other ways. If you want to get involved in this, the best way to start is to start by contributing to Python. As I've talked about, uh, leadership is drawn from and accountable to the community of active contributors. So becoming a contributor is your first step towards participating in leadership. And there's some great resources for getting more, invo uh, more involved. There's a uh, very detailed contributing guide at devguide.python.org, uh, which, and I've linked to that again at the end of the talk. 
Python also has a core mentors program. Uh, so if you're serious about this, you can get matched up with an individual mentor who will personally work with you to help you uh, contribute. And again, I've linked to that at the end of the slide. You should just assume if I mention something, I've linked to that at the end of the slides. Uh, and if you're more interested in like the community side of things, there's many great volunteer opportunities with the PSF. So I want to take a moment to talk about the lessons of the Python project for Python projects as a whole. Because I think there's some really relevant lessons here. So many projects have only informal governance systems. Uh, and it's important to stress here that all projects have some kind of governance system. Just because it's entirely at the whim of a single person doesn't mean that that's not a governance process. It's just a really informal and spontaneous and implicit governance process. Um, and many projects start with a single person. And as the project goes, that founder sort of just by default retains their authority. And when governance is formalized, it's often, though not always, codified into this BDFL model. So the path that Python and Guido took is really very common. A number of projects have sort of a partial formalization of their governance. They'll specify who's in charge, but not necessarily how we change our governance model, so that foundational level of decision making. So when they do have to change, either because someone retires or flakes out or moves on or is abusive or just for whatever reason that their current governance system isn't working, they're at a loss for how to change it. And there's a bit of a tension here because I know that for many people, if you're trying to build in explicit governance processes too early, it can be seen as adding unnecessary bureaucracy to the project. But the alternative is often worse because Many projects discover the need for governance processes only once there's an active conflict in the community. And when that happens, the people involved are already deeply invested in and have chosen sides in that conflict. And it's a much rougher place to be making governance decisions from because you have to make all of these complicated uh, choices from positions of mistrust. Uh, and the different levels of decision making get entangled because you want a specific person to be in charge because you know that they're on your side on whatever the specific conflict is uh, and it's hard to separate making the decision about making the decision from that person you want to end up with. So it's not a great place to end up. So my recommendation for projects is to get that first level of decision making done, that how to decide how we're going to decide step. And it doesn't have to change anything about the experience of participating or who the leader of the project is, because you're not saying anything about who's going to govern or even how they're going to govern, just how you're going to decide how they're going to govern. So uh, you can keep your BDFL, but just spell out if you were going to change away from a BDFL model, how are you going to make that decision? So that for Python, that would have been the equivalent of already having PEP 8001 before Guido stepped down. And your version of PEP 8001 might not look like PEP 8001, it probably won't, but it should cover how the decision that ha about what happens next will be made. Is it gonna be vote, consensus, what type of vote, majority versus supermajority, and also who is going to get to make it, who can propose options and who can decide on the outcome. And then finally, another lesson to take from Python. When you're changing the governance of an existing system, think about what resources and systems already exist. The Python language team made extensive use of existing pet processes, of the core dev team, and of the PSF. And I think the results would have seemed less legitimate if they hadn't done that. So that's the end of my talk. I think I have a few more minutes. Hmm, do I have any time? I have about a minute. So I won't, I, I'll take questions uh, outside in the hallway track. Um, but I just want to give a, a brief thank you to Carol Willing and Brett Cannon for answering some of my questions uh, before I gave this talk. Hopefully I did not egregiously misrepresent anything. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of links here for some of the things that I've mentioned. Uh, I have a talk on Libre Planet, uh, from Libre Planet back in March that talks about governance from a more abstract perspective, talks about Python and a few other different projects. Uh, and if you're interested in nerding out with me about governance, please come find me because I'm a little bit obsessed. All right, thank you so much, everyone.